do you ever anticipate yourself traveling for journalism again? Or, sure. Oh, to yeah? travel, yeah. But mm-hmm. just nothing like this. Uh, yeah, no, I don't need to do dangerous travel anytime soon. No. No. Yeah, some people just want to jump right back into the fire. Yeah, that's not, but that was not the point in the first place. Right. What was the point? Like, what did you hope to get out of this trip to Somalia? Well, so one one thing that I noticed while I was watching the trial in, um, in, in Hamburg was this clash between a modern liberal state, which is what Germany is, um, and so is America, by the way, um, and an archaic crime. And Germany, in fact, is newer than the United States in the sense that its constitution was written in 1949 when nobody was thinking about piracy. So the laws against piracy are extremely lenient in in German law in a way that they're not in Spanish or American law. Um, We have laws that date back to when it was a capital crime. And basically the Germans didn't know how to deal with these guys. And uh, I thought it was fascinating in the first place that this ancient crime had revived after a couple centuries of relative quiet, you know. And um, so I, that tension on its own was interesting, and that was worth the book because nobody was quite approaching it that way, you know. Uh, so that tension is still interesting, and that tension is still alive. So there are certainly threats to modern liberal states going on around the world. So w- what were the trials in Berlin? Uh, there was a trial in Hamburg, and I, I was going back and forth from Berlin. Uh, it was 10 guys from Somalia who uh, tried to hijack a cargo ship that belonged to a um, a German uh, ship ship company in, that was based in Hamburg. Uh, I think they were overpowered by the Dutch n- Navy, but the Dutch handed them over to the Germans. In fact, the J- Dutch said, okay, we'll do this as long as we don't have to try them because everyone knew from the outset that there was going to be a, a problem uh, trying Somalis. Um, well, in what way? Um, in Europe in general, but especially in, in Germany, I think there's a actually a a law against shipping them back to Somalia because it's considered not a safe place. Um, For them? For them, even for them. And I think that's nuts. Once they were convicted, I think they should have been deported after they served their time. That's so bizarre. But but if they were shipped back to Somalia, how would they be treated? Like, what is the government like in Somalia? I mean, Good must question. Be insanely corrupt. I asked some of my pirates about that. Um, it it is corrupt. It's a it's either corrupt or non-existent. So the the government in Somalia is focused around Mogadishu, and it just doesn't have that much power in the provinces. And I was in one of the one of the provinces, and because the provinces don't get a whole lot of money from Mogadishu, so they they run their own businesses. When in, in some cases, piracy. Um, I asked one of my guards what would happen if a pirate went and got thrown into jail in some other country and then came back and tried to you know, set up friendships again with his old pirate buddies or whatever. You know, would he be killed? Would he be in, in danger? He's like, no, no, no problem. <laughs> They'd probably let you right back in. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, is there any sort of punishment for, for them when they get back to Somalia? Is there any penal system or... Uh, potentially there is, yeah. So but that's there are, not considered a crime. There right? are, y- yes, it is. So there, there are l- laws on the books, especially in the regions, um, and even prisons for pirates. Um, the problem is that clan relationships are a lot more important than newly written laws, um, and so even pirates who go to jail, this was true about one boss in my case, uh, might get out again. So this guy, this guy who was a pirate boss in my case wound up in jail while I was still captive for one month in Mogadishu and wound up walking. Wow. Yeah. And he was captive for piracy? Mm, I think for having weapons that the government didn't expect to see in one of his houses. So uh, it was something off to the side, but so uh, it's a really sketchy system of bartering and payoffs. and It's who you know and yeah. who you're related to. And the, there are other prisons for you know low-ranking pirates in Puntland and also in Galkayo where I was. Um, it's a crapshoot how much time those guys are going to spend in jail. And what happened with the people in Germany? They got a total of seven years, I think, or an average of seven in years. In Germany? In Germany. And then what happened when they were released? Nothing. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that's a whole separate story, which I haven't even you know, started, started to address. But as it turned out, a few of them went back to Somalia anyway. And probably went right back into the business. 
Uh, well, or something else, uh, you know, illicit or profitable or whatever. Yeah. And there's a wide variety of people that they target, right? They target people on individual crafts. They target large boats, commercial yep. vessels. Yep. They they did all of that. I mean, in fact, I met hostages from all of those, you know, from the whole range. So, How the, many hostages did you meet over the two years and eight months? Um, a total of 30. So the, the crew on the fishing ship, the tuna vessel, was 28. And then I met two Seychelles Wa fishermen. The two guys from the Seychelles were small time, so they were just on a small craft. What is Seychelles? And the Seychelles is a um, chain of islands off Africa. It's, uh, it's a country that belongs to Africa, um, but it has a, a French name. Um, the, the guys on the tuna vessel um, were from a you know, relatively big ship. The guys from the Seychelles were from a f small private craft, and I was an example of someone captured on land. So. And these people that were from the small private cl craft, it, it, who were they trying to get money from? Just anyone who knows them? Is that how they, they do this? Yeah, whoever. Anybody whoever can they pay. can. I mean, of course they ask from the government, but the government doesn't always pay. You know, the given government. Yeah. Just, it, it's just the whole system seems so insane that they've got, I mean, they, they keep people for years and years. Yeah. And they have just a, a whole collection of them how they're trying to extract money from people that know them yeah uh, as it turns out they're not very good at it so pirates are in the kidnapping business but they don't always know what they're doing um, the the bosses I think got used to um, demanding a lot of money from shipping companies and finding out that if you hold a ship stubbornly for a long time uh, you get a lot of money from the insurance company or whatever um, I that that calculation doesn't work with human beings so, in other words, everyone else on Earth who who negotiates for a human being expects the the person's price to go down as the time, you know, wears on, and um, it took a while for pirates to understand that. Wow, what is it? I mean, when you're de you're dealing with all this, like, what what is it like on your psyche when you're getting two years in, two and a half years in? And you, you, you have some sort of light at the end of the tunnel. What, what, is it, what does it feel like? Well, I didn't know there was light at the end of the tunnel. So um, two years in, that's where, um, you know, it was either forgive the guards or, or, or self-destruct. Um, it was also, by then, I had also uh, deliberately given, let go of ha having any kind of hope. So that, that was a second survival strategy. I, I had to um, not hope that I was going to get out uh, because hoping was, had a downside. That cycle of hope and despair uh, was extremely damaging to, to my mental well-being. So the, after going through that cycle a few times, I'm like, well, I have to find a different way. Yeah. One of the things that um, I've gotten out of travel is I think it, it – your view of the world changes when you see the way people are living in different places. You, you, your spectrum expands. Mm -hmm. You start recognizing like, oh, I might be used to Southern California, but this is not how they do things in Ohio. Mm -hmm. This is not how they do things in Italy. This yep. is not how, when you go as far as being a captive in Somalia, your, your spectrum mm -hmm. is massive. <laughs> I mean, your view of the world being entrenched in that life and being with those people while they're chewing this narcotic and carrying around Kalashnikovs and yelling at each other in a foreign language and watching fist fights and realizing like they don't have anything either. Mm -hmm. What? How much has that changed you as a human being and your your view of human life on Earth? Well, I think enormously. I mean, I, I, you're right. It expanded my range and my, my understanding of, of what other people think. Um, they obviously come from a completely different perspective in Somalia. Not only are they um, Muslim and African, but they're also very isolated. So Somalia, as a, as a rule, has always been difficult to penetrate for out outsiders. That was true when Richard Burton was there in the 19th century, too. Um, it's, it's a closed culture. And um, they have their own way of thinking. 
and also the also the language is not related to most other languages you've heard unless you you're familiar with languages in Ethiopia. Did you learn any of it? Yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. But um, I resisted learning it from the guards. I, th I when I was there, I I thought about it like um, in in Berlin, you realize that a lot of East Germans when um, during the communist era were taught Russian in school, and a lot of them hated it. And I was not in a mood to learn Somali, Somali once I was a captive. Mm. So um, it was similar to that. I, uh, I l learned a few words, but I never had a good teacher. Um, and of course, when I was a journalist, I was relying on translators. I would imagine that as a writer, that spectrum, the expansion of the spectrum, although there's no way you would ever barter it off or bargain to have those experiences, to broaden your spectrum, mm -hmm. it, it has to have changed the way you put pen to paper mm -hmm. and view the world and your your ability to describe things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, you you realize that each individual has a certain certain boundaries, you know, yeah. and, and certain, certain self-definitions. Um, and those self-definitions can be, they, the the distance between one individual and another can be enormous, um, but in some sense also they're superficial distinctions. So, yeah, but the, their inescapable reality is so alien mm -hmm. in comparison to someone who lives in Bel Air. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Just this this just that contrast mm -hmm. between this world that you were so deeply entrenched in for two in two years and eight months. Mm -hmm. Like that has got to change the way you look at human life. Yeah, uh, because the gulf in wealth is so enormous. I mean, they can't imagine the, the amount of money it takes to live in Bel Air. And, right. and the other way around, I mean, it, I think it's very difficult for someone in California to imagine how little you can get by on um, and how close to the earth some, most people on the planet live. Yeah, there's a statistic that I read once that I, I repeat all the time because it still baffles me. That if you make more than thirty-four thousand dollars a year, you're in the one percent of the world. Of the world, yeah, possibly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is probably magnified manyfold in Ethiopia. Yeah, in Ethiopia and Somalia. I mean, it's it's very, um, you know, in some ways. Although they want money all the time, especially if they're criminals, um, the the money that we're used to sort of greasing our path through life around here um, is just not available. It's just not not part of the reality. What do so, they do with money when they get it? Well, it depends. If if they're pirates, they splash out on a fancy car or or cars. Did you see like fancy that. cars? When you sure. Were there? Oh, yeah. No, I was placed in fancy cars. I mean, really? Yeah. No. So the bi pirates had great cell phones, um, expensive SUVs, um, weapons that they had bought you know, from abroad and maybe a weapons bazaar in Mogadishu or something like that. Uh, but that's not cheap either. Uh, they they bragged about how the, the the bullets cost like a dollar each, you know, and the, one of them might, might have been wearing a band of 500 bullets. Um, and the cut is expensive. So lots of things cost an enormous amount of money in Somalia. But if you're, a, you know, if you're a very ordinary Somali, Somali you, you're getting by on, you know, less than a dollar a day. So there's the ordinary Somalis who are not criminals mm -hmm. or not pirates, at least. Mm -hmm. And then you and have that's the majority, the majority. Mm -hmm. And you, then you have these pirates that are essentially running through the streets in Mercedes Benz. They're like SUVs. gangsters. They're like gangsters. Wow. And that's that's actually how one Somali who had some connection to Germany um, described him to me. He, you know, he he was wandering around in Galkayo because it was his hometown in some way, or his ancest ancestral town, and he he had met some. This was before I got captured. It was like they were, you know, they had rap thumping from the SUVs. Did they really? <laughs> American rap? Who knows? Who knows? There's, there's lots of actually good African rap. Really? Oh yeah, 